where we thank you wonderful thank you ricky well welcome and our uh, i'm so glad that you are all able to join us tonight i know we're really excited to um hear more about uh about the impacts of solar weather hey vic you did make it you didn't put the kids in the closet did you vic i just kicked them out Oh, okay. <laughs> Vicky mailed me and said he had student issues after school. So <laughs> I cleared the issues. You cleared the issues. Always a positive thing, Vic. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. We're glad you're able to join us. So our question for tonight is um, if anybody was able to view the lunar eclipse, and if you have plans uh, to be able to view the solar eclipse, I know here in Chicago, it's gonna be happening uh, right at sunset on the western side of the city. So unfortunately, I will not be able to see it. Um, I will see the effects of the light, but I won't be actually be able to view the eclipse because there um, are large buildings in my way. So, uh, and it's about an hour for me <laughs> to go across the city, hour, an hour and a half for me to be able to get to somewhere where I'd be able to view it. But how about the rest of you? We, the weather in we got it right here. It's 1.30. Okay. With, with I'm the, sorry, go ahead. What? Say that again, Vic. We got 1.30. We got the eclipse. And every student will be able to watch it. Right here. Okay. We all got phones. And they can use the phone to block the sun and use the camera. Boom. There it'll be. 21st century solar filter. And an iPad will even work better because you can put sunglasses on it. And if it's too bright, it'll damper it. It beats the prime pinhole cameras and try and find the, the welding mass over here in the shop. And uh, it works. If it's clear. That's awesome, Vic. <laughs> I had never, it didn't even occur to me to use my phone. That's so fantastic. Sally, it's, what were you going to say? It's not going to be clear in the east. I'm going to talk about it with kids, but it's just... The weather is, we got, what, a week of rain. So, and it's going to stay here for a week. We're just going to live with this. Nice rain, little flooding, and, you know, the whole bit. Well, we can thank the mountains for it, because the mountains had it first, and then they passed it on to the plains, and now we're giving it to you, Sally. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, we should thank you. <laughs> We've already had our best weather. It was 80 the last two days. It started raining about 20 minutes ago, and it's supposed to be ugly the rest of the week. Um, did I see the lunar eclipse? Yes, that was really cool. Um, and I started talking with the school district about a month and a half ago about the solar eclipse, and I put together a folder with information um, from this group and other sources like Wavelength, um, and I put together a Google Doc folder to share with the whole school district with teachers, even if they don't teach science, if they have the kids all day, they'll be able to talk to them about the sun, about the moon, about eclipses. Um, it starts at 2.58 here. We're going to be at maximum about 4.20 our time. And I've challenged the kids throughout the whole district to put that A into STEM and make it STEAM and add art. And I'm challenging them to make um, pinhole cameras, pinhole projectors. Um, I found some pictures on the internet. Somebody had a Ritz cracker that was a pinhole projector, um, cheese grater. They wrote their name in paper. They had a whole bunch. And so I've challenge them. Several of the teachers are taking up that challenge, which is really nice. Um, we're asking them to turn it in. We have an event at the local library. We've got the TV station coming. The local photography club is coming to take pictures of all these pinhole projections. Um, we're going to be on TV tomorrow for the local news, telling people to view responsibly. So with the pinhole cameras we're asking them to look down and not up and so hopefully the weather will be nice wow lynn that is huge we is there a way that you can uh is it can you share your list um post your list on the widgeo from all of your resources Definitely. are they are they ones that are already there 
there's a lot there was stuff that I got there um, from night sky network um, I told them all about wavelength and I took some stuff off of wavelength so yes so please keep pushing wavelength please 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 uh, that's okay. awesome Wow, Lynn, busy as always. That's amazing. <laughs> One of the benefits of being in a lab full of astronomy nerds is they are actually doing a whole setup out here on the patio on Thursday afternoon for us. They're some of the guys from um, some of the guys who build instruments are going to bring out their telescopes and we're going to have a what we call a, a, a patio party, which is usually snacks and beer and telescopes and solar scopes in this case. So that'll be fun. Also, just to let everyone know that I've recorded a podcast about cultural perspectives of solar eclipses, and that will be posted on the 365 Days of Astronomy website on Thursday. So it's not up there yet, but um, let me see if I can find the link to the web page and I'll put it in the chat window and, and you'll be able to see that go live on Thursday. Make sure you put it on the Widgeo too, Nancy, so we can all find it there. Sure, will do. That would be great. That's awesome. All, right, and all of you mountain people in, Cal in California, all you Berkeley folks have that lovely view from those hills. That's going to be so beautiful. Dr. Baker or, or Paul, what about you guys? Are you going to be able to see? Are you going to be around to be able to view it? I hope so. That's my plan. Uh, it's been cloudy here uh, off and on, so possibly. Dr. Baker, where will you, will you be there? Will you be in Boulder when you are oh, able to look at it? Yeah. Oh, you'll have a good view of that. That's I nice. So. Yeah. That's nice. I'm going to be up your way uh, next week. Not this week, but next week. I'll be in Denver. So I'm hoping yeah. to make a trip up to Boulder. But yeah, uh, yeah but not in time for the solar eclipse. <laughs> Well, I want to welcome Karen Houck. I know that uh, many of you have seen her face before in many venues, and she is a precious, precious commodity to our community. Um, and we're so glad that when she's able to join us, she's so much fun. I have to say that, you know, even though I'm in Chicago, um, Karen is a barrel of fun in person for sure. So <laughs> I'm always excited when she joins us for our meetings because she's a hoot. Um, I was wondering if Claire knows that week. Irish expression. <laughs> it might be an Americanism. I think you said a barrel of fun, and I'm like, oh, is that some kind of cow reference? <laughs> a barrel of fun? No, you said a bear lify. Oh, no, a barrel oh, of fun. You know, like monkeys, only Karen. <laughs> okay, a barrel of one. Yes, I'm with you on that Wow. One. Thank you, Andy. And I concur. Aww. You guys are nice. Um, don't be confused by that other screen that says Karen Hauk. That's not me. I had technical difficulties, so I ran down to Claire's office. But um, I was just going to remind everyone that um, Solar Week, which is a week of online um, resources about the sun for middle schoolers and maybe early high schoolers. It happens twice a year and it will be next week, Monday through Friday. Um, it's solarweek.org. And sure oh yeah, Claire's going to share it for me. Um, the website has two parts and one part is the um, a week of curriculum and games and activities for teachers and it has a, a kind of a special section called what to do if you only have 45 minutes. So it's kind of a guided thing or you can jump in and out of any of the lesson plans. But the other part is this part that Claire has showed and that is the um, interactive bulletin board where there are, um, there are about, usually about 10 or 15 uh, solar scientists on hand to answer any questions that the kids have about the sun. Um, and also, not, not just about the sun, but also about their, their career and their life. Like, what were they like as kids? Were, did they want to be a scientist? There's, there's supposed to be sort of a role model effect, particularly for, um, it's particularly to encourage girls in the sciences, but the, the website is for both girls and boys, but all the solar scientists are, are women. Um, and then there's a whole section on the website about solar careers and then women in science and women in astronomy. And um, so basically what we encourage classrooms to do if they want to participate in the bulletin board part is to kind of discuss and come up with one classroom question. Because when we asked people to, in the past, to just ask any question and people kept repeating the same question. So we have them sort of discuss and look at the bulletin board and come up with, with questions about 
all kinds of things, magnetism and solar storms and flares. And the eclipse will be a great opportunity to talk about that. So I expect we'll get some questions on that. Um, do you want to like quickly go to the other part of the yep. website? Oh, yeah, why don't I try? <laughs> um, so this is the home page, but you can see that Monday starts with a kind of basic, our sun is a star, and then you, you learn about the sun as a star, and you can play a game and do an activity and have a scavenger hunt. And Tuesday starts getting more in-depth with looking at the sun, and Wednesday talks about the, the dynamism of the sun. Then, then Thursday is usually like a revolving theme, and um, this year, or this time round, we're talking about ancient observatories. Um, and then Friday focuses on solar careers. So some people just go to this part of the website and never go to the bulletin board. Some people go to the interactive bulletin board and ask questions and read all that stuff and, and never come to this side. And some people use both. So it's really for all kinds of educators. And um, yeah, that's that. Would be great to see any of you there for whatever period of time you want to drop in. How many of you have used this? I know I ask this every six months, but um, Lynn, I know you've used it. Sally, have you or Chris? Sally, you're on mute if you're talking. I think. Yes, I have used it. Um, but it's interesting because I my real students won't come in until November. So I will talk to teachers who are now teaching in the high school and Pinnacle and some of them are doing earth science. So, um, but I have used it, but it's in the off weeks of when I'm, you know, I'm, I'm assuming this will still stay on and I use some of their activities. Yeah. I mean that the, the kind of curriculum side of it is, is it's up all year long. It's just that the, the part that we promote the the one week in the fall and one week in the spring um, when the when the solar scientists are actually available to answer live questions and, stuff. and the the fun part of this from the solar scientists perspective is that you then get to interact with other female scientists from all over the world, not even just the US. So one person will ask a question and then three or four people might chime in on the same question and it's kind of neat to get an insight into your colleagues, yeah. hobbies and pets and so on. Or how they well. do like life work balance yeah. or how do they have a family and be a scientist at the same time. But it's also interesting to look at the kinds of questions that the kids come up with. And some of them are very standard and ones that you would expect and have been answered every year. But then some of them are completely off the wall and you're like where did you even where did this come from how did you get here so it's it's a it's a real trip to be on the answering end of things as well mm. and it's the, the scientists are all volunteering their time which is like always touches me with their uh generosity in in doing that so they can just jump in anytime 24 7 during that week and and answer questions but um claire is definitely one of the people that that really have been such a great resource in answering umpteen questions every time. Does anybody have any questions about Solar Week or suggestions? And use it; it's exciting. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks for giving me a chance to share. Thank you for coming, Karen. You're always welcome. We'd love to see your sunny face. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing about that. And it is, like they said, it's up all year round, but, um, but the time to really get to ask your good questions are... Now, I'm sorry, Karen, I do... Remind me again, I think you did say it, um, but I was chatting. Um, the student who never talked in class, though that's now I talk um, in class, is uh, <laughs> it is that the, the boards with the past questions are up all year round too, right, in between sessions. So you can always go and see what other people asked um, the scientist, or do those get taken down in the off times? They froze. Hello there. There you go. Oh.
Okay, then. Oh, was my voice frozen? No, you're, you were, we were muted. Can you guys hear us? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the, if you if you were to go to the bulletin board right now, you would see the questions from last spring because it usually happens around the equinoxes in in um, spring and fall. So up till the Sunday night before the new solar week starts, you can see the answers to the last one. Then they're archived and they go to the bottom of the screen where you can see the archive of all the previous solar weeks. And then um, the boards are cleared off for a fresh fresh batch of questions ready for Monday morning. So you can always read the old ones and they, and then when the new ones come up, they stay until the next occurrence of solar week. So Sally, your students could go and review the questions of, of times past and then formulate their questions for the spring one. Um, if they're around during that time, that would, that would be a good way to use that maybe. Mm -hmm. That would work. Well, thank you again so very much. It's always exciting to have Solar Week and be excited about the sun. Not that we're not excited every day, but have ever, other people be enthusiastic about the sun. So thank you again, Karen. It's um, really great work. It's a really great opportunity. And thank you, Claire, for being willing to answer questions and uh, be the science link for people. That is a really big draw for students and teachers to be able to ask, really ask the science, the scientists. So. We're great. All right. Well, I know we've all waited to um, hear from Dr. Baker, and so I, he has said moving from Solar Week will tie right in to, especially with all the activities that has been happening on the sun in the last few weeks, um, which has been really, really exciting. Um, I love watching Facebook and, and seeing people hear on the news that there are solar storms, and then... Um, always followed up by the warning, be careful out there, friends. So I see it as a perfect <laughs> opportunity to, uh, to talk with my, my friends about uh, what that really means and, and how it affects them. But I am really looking forward to this, this talk uh, to, be able to be able to say more about what other things people can look for. So Dawn, do you want to introduce our guest? Sure. I'm very excited to introduce this guest. Um, Dr. Baker uh, did a talk here at APL, and it was so interesting and um, that I – I was really hoping that he would do it for us, and he has agreed. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Baker. Um, Dr. Baker is the director of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where he is also professor of astrophysical and planetary sciences and professor of physics. His primary research interest is the study of plasma, physical, and energetic particle phenomena in planetary magnetospheres and in the Earth's vicinity. He conducts research in space instrument design, space physics data analysis, and magnetospheric modeling. Dr. Baker obtained his PhD degree with Dr. James Van Allen at the University of Iowa, followed by postdoctoral work at the California Institute of Technology with Edward C. Stone. He has held lead research positions in space plasma at Los Alamos National Laboratory and extraterrestrial physics at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. From 1994 until now, he has been at uh, the University of Colorado. Dr. Baker has published over 750 ref refereed papers and has edited eight books on the topic of space physics. He currently is an investigator on several NASA space missions, including MESSENGER, MMS, and my very favorite, Van Allen probes. <laughs> um, he has won numerous awards for his research, education, and management accomplishments. And if you haven't already, I highly encourage you to see Dr. Baker's full bio, which uh, Andy has posted on the WIGEO page. Welcome, Dr. Baker, and thank you so much for joining us today to share with us the possible societal impacts of a large solar storm. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'm going to try to <clears throat> bring up my PowerPoint presentation here, and uh, let's see, I guess I'd like to share my screen. What do I have to do here to do that? There should be a button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, uh, let's see, is it the... Um, on my screen, my screen may look a little different than yours, but along the bottom there is a ribbon, and in the middle I have the word share screen, if you um, mouse is, over it. That, no, that doesn't do it. Are you Andy. on a Mac or a PC, Dr. Baker? I'm on a PC. Let's You're see. on a PC. 
Um, try, but there's no ribbon at the bottom that has your microphone and audio and. No, let's see. No? Let me, okay, let me so then go up, up to um, I go up to your share screen. Uh, let me do the share screen here and then. Yeah, let's let's go up to your menu and you should be able to do it from there. Let's see if we can do that and then share screen only. Okay, hey, now, there it goes. Okay, let's try this. Okay, let's see if that works. Maybe it's... Looks good on our end. Okay, good. Yep, yep perfect. Okay. So it's so easy, even a rocket scientist could do it. Okay, I'm going to um, talk to you tonight about extreme space weather and societal impacts. Um, the slide you're looking at here was put together by NASA, probably by solar scientists, judging from the size of the sun. Um, and I'd like to make the point with this opening graphic that we as, a, as developed societies and developing societies have really embedded ourselves in a cyber electric cocoon. This cyber electric cocoon extends from beneath the ocean surfaces uh, with uh, underwater cables. Many technologies on the surface of the earth that are susceptible to solar storms, the effects of solar storms. And of course, whole layers extending up through the atmosphere and into the Earth's uh, extended magnetosphere where satellites operate that can be very severely impacted by solar storms. I'm going to try to talk to you about those things today. And I'd welcome questions if people have them as I go through this. This is a graphic I like to use, which really, um, again, uh, I don't have to tell you, but the uh, other than the Earth being much too large relative to the Sun and the Earth not being that close to the Sun, it's a perfect illustration of our Sun-Earth system. But the upper branch of this, if I can move my cursor, I don't know if I can, yeah. This upper branch is sort of the scientific branch that we like to study, understanding how the Sun works and understanding how that affects magnetospheres such as the region around our Earth and then comparing that to other planets, and we're, of course, finding more planets all the time, and extending our knowledge onto the broad plasma universe. But the other branch, the lower branch, is really one that uh, we're going to be discussing mostly tonight, and that's how this space environment can affect humans in space, how it can affect such things as satellite operations, power systems on the Earth's surface, communication, and uh, possibly even affect um, the uh, Earth's climate and hence contribute to climate change. So the definition or a definition of space weather is shown here and this is from the US National Space Weather Program a strategic plan that was uh, completed in June of 2010. But as you can read for yourself here it talks about the many different kinds of ways that uh, the space environment can affect technological systems, can endanger human life and health and affect a wide uh, panoply of different technologies on which we rely all the time. I often ask people to think about what would a day in their lives be like without the space segment, without the ability to have the satellites we rely on, the kind of information that we get from spacecraft and uh, all the other things where the space sector really touches our, our lives. And uh, I think that's a very sobering thing when one thinks about it. So uh, I hope my uh, animation will play here, and it looks like it's coming up. But uh, I don't have to tell all of you, since I just heard your discussion, that you understand very well that our sun is our most important star in the universe. And how this star works is a matter of a great interest to us all. But of course, the space weather we're talking about, in some sense, begins with photons being generated at the center of the sun and the nuclear furnace at the center, taking maybe 100,000 years to make their way out to the edge of the radiative zone. Then we have the outer part of the sun, the outer quarter or so, that's known as the convective zone. And in this region, the roiling plasmas um, rotate at different speeds, faster at the equator, slower at the pole. That differential motion creates shears that uh, generate um, strong magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are um, form what we would call a dynamo, 
and then that field can emerge the uh, upwelling and downwelling, the roiling, boiling surface of the sun is fascinating in its own right. Sunspots from which strong magnetic fields emerge. And from these active regions on the sun, we see many of the kinds of disturbances that we worry most about from a space weather standpoint. Beautiful data now from uh, operating satellites, uh, NASA satellites, seeing these huge prominences blast off uh, into space. Uh, we see that uh, there can be uh, active regions, bands of active regions generating x-rays, strong magnetic fields emerging into these complex magnetic patterns, and ultimately leading to large uh, expulsions of material, perhaps 10 billion tons of material moving out at 7 or 8 million miles an hour, constituting one of the real risks that uh, the Earth faces from um, powerful solar storms. So of course we have the x-rays that are generated from many of the active regions and uh, often these things emerge from uh, with a flare like the one we just saw there and then the uh, subsequent coronal mass ejection makes its way uh, at a slower pace but nonetheless very fast out to the Earth's vicinity. So we have a lot of systems and I'm going to talk to you about some of the systems that we have to observe this and to help um, provide forewarning to the citizens of the Earth about the sun and its activity. This is a, a slide that uh, I like to show just to remind us that uh, the sun undergoes approximately 11 year activity cycle, really a 22 year magnetic cycle since the magnetic polarity uh, flips um, during that uh, 22 year cycle. But uh, this is a series of snapshots taken in soft x-rays from the Yoko, a joint Japanese US satellite over an 11 year period, showing uh, first the sun in its active phase and then quieting down to a very inactive state and then coming back to the uh, active state once again. I think it's fair to say that we don't know exactly why the sun has an about 11 year period. In fact, it's not a very, um, it's not very stably 11 years. It can be longer or shorter. Uh, other suns, other stars like our sun, um, have undergo activity cycles as well, but they can be quite different in period. And the Kepler spacecraft has been observing a lot of uh, sunlight stars and seeing quite a range of behaviors. Uh, one thing that you probably are well aware of is that uh, the sun has been, and sunspots as one measure of solar activity have been uh, traced now for over 400 years. Galileo first trained a satellite on the sun in the early 1600s and uh, in about the mid 1700s the sunspot cycles the 11 year cycles started to be uh, traced the lower panel here in blue shows the uh, numbered cycles we are now in cycle 24 um, and uh, of course uh, shortly after the sun uh, spots were recognized and started to be studied the sun became extremely quiet for a period of over 50 years. Uh, this was known as the Maunder minimum of solar activity. Uh, there have been other periods of relative quiescence. Interestingly enough, just a few years ago, in 2007, 8, 9, our sun became uh, extraordinarily quiet. The solar minimum that it, uh, the sun went through uh, was uh, among the, the deepest and longest minima that have been seen. and uh, of the top panel from our colleague Ron Turner uh, over plots from two years before to two years after the solar minimum uh, for the many cycles that are uh, shown in blue there and just puts the 2007 to 2010 minimum into perspective and it was about as quiet as the sun was uh, about 200 years ago during the minimum. So. The sun, uh, every time we think we understand what the sun's going to do, it tends to throw uh, something uh, different at us, and so it's uh, rather difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen. But uh, just say five, uh, four or five years before that deep minimum, the sun was extraordinarily active. Uh, this is from the famous Halloween storm period in late October 2003, and it's a sequence of images from the SOHO uh, spacecraft. And uh, first you see here the flare uh, that occurs in the active region. And then there is a 
uh, noise, snow that appears in the picture. These are the very prompt energetic particles produced in the solar active region. And then this uh, telescoping picture of the complete sun is uh, from a chronograph uh, measurements from the SOHO spacecraft and shows this blast of material coming out pretty symmetrically. And so this is what we call a halo coronal mass ejection. And uh, this is coming straight at the Earth. And uh, these storms in late October were uh, truly immense and caused a huge number of technical problems for systems back in that time. The uh, next image uh, that I hope will come up here, yes, uh, is uh, more of an artist's concept for the kind of space weather that we most are concerned about, and it is these coronal mass ejections. As I noted, uh, these uh, lift off from the sun uh, quite often at high speed. A little later, I'll talk to you about one of the recent ones that was really amazing. Uh, this one, uh, this uh, illustration shows this uh, 10 billion ton blast of material coming out. If the magnetic fields within the cloud of the material are the right form, they can open the gate of the Earth's magnetosphere, can impart huge amounts of energy to the system, and can lead ultimately to a bright aurora, powerful um, uh, geomagnetic storms, and immense effects on all the kinds of technologies that we were talking about before. Just to put this into some context, this region around the Earth hosts a wide range of different spacecraft, and of course the uh, atmospheric and ground-based systems that can be susceptible. Just one illustration of this is the huge number of satellites that are out at the geostationary orbit at 6.6 um, .6 Earth radii from the center of the Earth. And uh, these fill almost every available niche around the uh, geostationary band. And uh, this is probably an outdated estimate now, but there are well, several hundred billion dollars worth of space assets just in these civilian satellites at geostationary, all of them being possibly susceptible to the space radiation. So a few years ago, uh, no, I guess a decade or more ago, uh, in Science Magazine put together a perspective about space weather, and this diagram from that just makes the point that solar disturbances can come out and affect the uh, environment around the Earth as well as the Earth itself. <clears throat> the kinds of things that we worry about for space systems include the effects of uh, high energy particles, the kinds of things that cause the snow, in the picture that I showed you before, <clears throat> can also cause uh, enhancements in the radiation belts. And of course, I will talk about that. Also can cause surface charging on spacecraft. And the high energy ion effects can include memory upsets, degradation of solar panels, and a wide variety of things. But just one graphic illustration of the effect is this one. In the active uh, period of the sun in the year 2000, uh, there was a uh, powerful storm then, too, that was called the Bastille Day event. And uh, this storm, this is a picture, a beautiful ultraviolet uh, image of the sun taken uh, early on the 14th of July. Just about six and a half hours later, that same picture looks like this. This is now, uh, again, the blinding of the CCD camera by the high energy particles from the uh, sun. So before and after. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to, <clears throat> to think about uh, human and space, human eye, human brain being subjected to this huge barrage of extremely high energy particles. And of course, uh, every system in space becomes an energetic particle detector, whether it wants to be or not. And this is uh, really a, a very substantial part of the risk to human systems. The uh, other uh, thing I'll talk about, and, uh, and uh, Don mentioned, uh, one of my favorite missions, too, the Van Allen Probe's mission, which has been measuring the radiation belt environment, and these high-energy electrons that can bury themselves in dielectric material. And uh, this illustrates the idea there that under normal circumstances, um, high-energy electrons in space from the Van Allen belt, say, can uh, pass through uh, the spacecraft uh, shielding can bury themselves in insulator material, but they will leak out and uh, reach some kind of equilibrium and generally not cause severe problems. But if the buildup is fast enough and strong enough, it can lead to a small electrical discharge inside of sensitive electronics. This can damage 
um, in very substantial ways. The electronic uh, pathways can cause failures of the uh, systems. And uh, this has led to um, many, many satellite losses or anomalies. And, and uh, for example, the Annex satellites uh, that were, uh, these are the Canadian satellites that um, lost uh, control uh, in the 1990s. And we studied this in considerable detail. Um, <clears throat> is someone trying to uh, reach me? OK, good. Okay, so <clears throat> the uh, modern, as we've moved from the beginning of the space age to the present time, there are many new technologies that are uh, substantially uh, affected by space weather. So there are many new drivers of uh, need for space weather forecasts, and this just lists some of them. I'm sure many of you use the global positioning, uh, global navigation systems, GNNS, uh, general term. The next generation air transportation system is going to be um, a very uh, aware of and dependent on knowledge of the space weather situation. We're going to talk more about the vulnerability of the power grid to space weather, uh, commercial space industry, and of course human exploration and so on many, many different areas, increasingly um, significant concerns about space environment and space weather effects. This is a somewhat old uh, diagram. I just show it because it's, uh, it was quite an underestimate, but this was made back in the uh, mid-2005 uh, period or so, uh, about the growth of the use of the global positioning satellite system. It's used in a wide variety of ways, as we'll talk about. You well know that there are uh, a constellation of 28 uh, active spacecraft that fly at about four Earth radii above the, uh, from the center of the Earth. And uh, the estimates were that this would grow by uh, some substantial amount by present time. Well, we've really exceeded this. This is a, a multi-trillion dollar kind of uh, system now. It's uh, the business that relies on GPS is just uh, staggering. And of course, it's used for uh, positioning, for surveying, for construction purposes, uh, seismic uh, data collection, um, and a whole host of other things, precision agriculture. And uh, this, uh, the, we are building more and more dependence all the time on the timing signals as well as the navigation signal uh, used for the GPS uh, program. And space weather can affect this in a, uh, quite a variety of ways. Of course, there can be direct effects on the global positioning satellites, but there can also be effects, simulations that are generated. Uh, there are regions in the ionosphere that cause simulations for radio signals. And so the ranging where we depend on uh, centimeter kind of accuracy for uh, being able to range systems using GPS can be substantially disrupted and can, in fact, be uh, really severely impacted by the space weather uh, effects. And one of the uh, hopes had been that this uh, GPS could be used to sort of eliminate the need for the ground-based uh, navigation systems that uh, airlines relied on, as illustrated here. So the idea was that uh, GPS could supplant this. But so the wide area augmentation system, which was being uh, tested back in the Halloween storm period, uh, here in this animation, uh, blue is good, red is bad. This is really an illustration of the total uh, ionospheric electron content. And over the course of this uh, period of time, just in a few hours' time, the system went from blue to uh, totally red, meaning that the system was essentially unusable. And this uh, persisted for, I think, about 30 hours or so that the, uh, the uh, GPS precision ranging for uh, WAS uh, really was lost because of the storm activity. And so this caused a real uh, rethinking of how one would be able to use um, GPS under extreme storm conditions. The next uh, diagram that I hope will come up here, yes. This is another um, impact uh, of for airlines. So airlines seem to have a lot of issues. and. Um, this is a diagram that makes the point that one is, isn't just waiting around for coronal mass ejections to reach the Earth. If there's a powerful X-ray storm of the solar flare that we talked about earlier, 
that flare can cause uh, intense ionization on the sunward side, on the day side of the Earth, affecting essentially the entire hemisphere. And this can cause uh, the uh, change in frequencies that can be used, high frequency and very high frequency radio communication can be knocked out or can be substantially altered. And so this can be uh, effects that last for uh, several hours uh, or the better part of the day. And there can be uh, quite a bit of disruption. And of course, we, in many systems, military and civilian systems, rely on uh, HF communication. And this can be uh, disrupted uh, quite substantially during solar flares. So that's a very prompt effect. Um, one of the uh, newer concerns, of course, is, uh, revolves around the fact that Airlines now are flying much more extensively between North America and Asia and are trying to find the most economical and uh, fastest uh, routes. And those now are the transpolar routes. And so um, airlines such as United Airlines fly a variety of pathways from Washington or Chicago to um, Asian uh, destinations. And flying over the uh, Whole, they have the company rules, FAA rules, require that they be constantly um, in radio contact. This can be done with satellite communication below 82 degrees, but the yellow circle up there, above those latitudes, they have to rely on HF communication again. And during a storm such as the Halloween storm, the entire polar region uh, acts as a funnel high energy particles from the sun, the things that caused the blinding of the CCD cameras we talked about before, can burrow down, uh, can funnel down into the north region. So you recognize the north pole there, and that red region is the, uh, is the broad swath where high energy solar particles can cause, again, radio outages and basically uh, obviate the ability to um, fly these polar routes when airlines can't fly the polar routes, they have to fly lower uh, latitude. They're usually bucking headwinds, and often this can lead to a uh, requirement that they add more fuel or stop along the way or uh, perhaps even cancel the flights uh, if the uh, radiation is intense enough and broadly distributed enough. So this is a new and uh, very substantial concern for uh, airlines. Uh, human space flight, we probably don't need to dwell on this too much other than to say that uh, we, of course, have the International Space Station um, operating continuously uh, uh, with uh, humans on board and uh, high energy uh, particles from the sun, from solar storms, as well as enhancements of the electron radiation belt can cause concern, especially for extravehicular activity. And, uh, and so uh, this is uh, a significant problem, but of course, if we're looking at even longer duration flights, let's say to Mars or so, then the, uh, there will be months, many, many months of uh, humans being out in free space where uh, solar storms can have a full impact on the vehicles. And so I was, it was my privilege uh, a number of years ago to chair this committee uh, for the National Research Council for the National Academies to look at the space radiation hazards. And one of the charts parts from that uh, listed some of the radiation risks that we are concerned about, uh, causing cancer, of course, uh, degenerative uh, tissue effects on the heart, the, the lungs, the digestive system, uh, damage to the central nervous system. All of these can be uh, long-term as well as more acute uh, risks. Uh, when it comes to acute risk, death is a bad one. Um, vomiting in a space suit uh, for those who are out on a planetary surface can be a, a definitely a life-threatening situation. And so um, the recognition that uh, space radiation is a, a strongly limiting factor for human exploration um, is uh, pretty well recognized. And this is probably one of the tall poles in the tent, as they say, about a long duration space flight. Um, I was uh, also uh, asked to chair in 2008 um, a study that goes right to the heart of the topic of uh, this lecture tonight, and that is the societal and economic impacts of severe space weather. We recognized that there had been many studies of the effects of uh, earthquakes, floods, and other kinds of hazards 
but that there had been relatively little done to try to assess broadly the economic and societal impacts of uh, space weather in any integrated sense. So we brought together in a workshop setting representatives from academia, industry, government, and all of these different sectors, uh, that some of which we've talked about already, to try to do an econometric analysis of what the benefits of better forecast would be and so forth. And this report has had quite a shelf life. Uh, it's been translated into a number of different languages. I have the Chinese version, which I can't read, but I uh, have this on my desk. Uh, and uh, there have been many other uh, countries that have used this as a springboard for doing their own assessment. But perhaps one of the most important figures from this study uh, was really this one about the interdependencies of society. You probably all realize this, but uh, you think about the, um, the cornerstone technologies such as electric power and how dependent everything else is on that. If you lose electric power, you quickly lose the ability to uh, pump oil and gas. Uh, gasoline, uh, you uh, often lose communication, or at least the kind you normally depend on. Provision of po potable water quickly ceases. Uh, effects on banking and finance can be almost immediate. Significant effects on transportation, emergency services, the things that you probably most need at these times, government services. And uh, whether it's uh, space weather or uh, tropospheric weather under certain circumstances of uh, the type that we saw in uh, Superstorm Sandy, for example, things that knock out electrical power quickly cascade to affecting all aspects of uh, modern technological life. And so this is a, an immense concern and probably one of the biggest uh, current concerns of the government about uh, severe space weather events. Also in the report was a, a diagram from a uh, colleague, John Kappelman, who had taken a particular storm. Uh, he chose to study a storm that occurred, uh, was pretty well documented back in the 1920s, was a very, very powerful storm, and looked at if that storm were to occur today, how would this affect the extremely high voltage uh, backbone of the electric power system in North America. And uh, here the purplish and black lines show the kind of uh, extremely high voltage backbone grid and the red and green kind of uh, circles represent where there would be very large geomagnetically induced currents that can burn out transformers and cause the loss of, uh, of those transformers. Literally hundreds of transformers would be at risk here. These are uh, house sized uh, transformers costing many tens of millions of dollars a piece and if those are knocked out uh, they would take months or years to be replaced and so this is a very substantial uh, risk and uh, you know imagine the uh, the uh, sector this entire eastern third of the United States that's circled there being without power for weeks months or possibly years it's really quite uh, staggering to think about so the uh, fact uh, that was discussed in the report was that the grid is becoming increasingly vulnerable to space weather effects. One of the reasons for this is that the system is operating closer and closer to uh, the margins all the time, more and more uh, reliance on electricity, and yet the infrastructure is not being uh, updated and, uh, and uh, moved along as quickly as it probably should be. And so there can, the... Um, Geomagnetically induced currents can burn out the transformer uh, windings and overheating can cause meltdown. And this is uh, really, as I said before, one of the, the big concerns. Question is how big can these uh, storms really be? And uh, the documented, uh, probably the most documented of the giant storms was an event that was actually the first uh, solar flare ever witnessed by at least uh, Western um, scientific guys. Uh, Richard Carrington in 1859 in late August, early September was um, looking at the uh, sun, was mapping sunspots, uh, sunspot groups, and saw a, a massive white light flare. He, he, we now recognize that that's what he saw. Over the period of the next few minutes or so, it flared up and then began to die down. Uh, other colleagues of his uh, had also seen this. They were also 
uh, mapping the sun at the time. And uh, over the next, uh, in the next couple of days, there were, uh, there was a huge uh, geomagnetic storm. And uh, one measure of how broad the effects were was the uh, fact that aurora were seen down to extremely low latitudes, seen uh, down to uh, Cuba in North America, as far north as uh, Santiago and Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. The uh, internet of that time, of that age, was of the Victorian age, was the uh, telegraph system, and this was uh, severely affected. Um, fires actually broke out from the sparking of induced currents in the telegraph wires in many places. The, um, the, many of the telegraph systems uh, went off of batteries and just operated on the currents that were induced in the wires by the storm. Uh, people could read a uh, newspaper by auroral lights in northeastern uh, United States, and there are fascinating accounts of this in the New York Times and other places uh, during this uh, storm period. So this Carrington event, or this actually pair of events, has been held up as perhaps the, the uh, kind of extreme case that we ought to be able to design to. Of course, we had very little knowledge of the sun in those days. We didn't have spacecraft observing the properties, and I'll, I'll touch on this in a second. But the um, low-frequency, high-consequence events, uh, the increasing vulnerability of the power grid, uh, this is somewhat garish. I apologize for the garish uh, slide here, but it really repeats the point that uh, the outages to the power grid could extend to periods of years and could be trillions of dollars of damage. And this kind of uh, study that was um, cited in the uh, Academy report uh, has been repeated more recently by Lloyds of London and largely validated. The, the a difference in some detail, but the conclusion is that there could be substantial outages in North America or in Europe or other uh, highly developed places. So these large storms, these large geomagnetic storms uh, that, uh, that have been garnered most attention um, have not generally occurred during the most active solar cycles. The 1859 storm, what's plotted here is sunspot number as you see over fun as a function of time into the early 2000s. And the uh, Carrington storm, the 1859 storm, occurred at the, uh, just after the peak of um, what was not a particularly large or high sunspot number cycle. Um, the 1921 storm that we just talked about from Kaffeman was also a relatively modest uh, activity cycle. And as I'll talk about in a bit, we are, have gone through now a pretty uh, wimpy, some would say, solar cycle maximum, and yet we've seen some very powerful solar disturbances. Let me talk about that here now for a second. And uh, this is a uh, picture of the sun on, uh, in July, taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, another magnificent solar observing platform that we have operating uh, near Earth, looking at the sun. In this active region, again, if I can use my cursor here, just point to this, this very nasty looking active region, or beautiful depending on your point of view, uh, was uh, popping off uh, powerful coronal mass ejections as it moved across the disk of the sun uh, toward the Earth. But um, just about a week later or so, as the sun had rotated and as this active region had moved beyond the limb of the sun, the Stereo A spacecraft, which was around, uh, away from the Earth, uh, where direction, was able to observe the sun. And so you, at the center you see an ultraviolet, the sun, then you see these nested chronographs. You see this huge blast of material uh, that's uh, reminiscent of what we looked at before and the blinding effect of the charged particles. So we have studied this event and uh, come to some, I think, significant conclusions. If you look at this, uh, I've asked you to just focus on the left side of the screen here. This is the top-down view. It says if you're looking down from the pole of the sun, down on the solar system. And uh, again, if I can use my cursor, the yellow dot, here's the Earth. And portrayed are some of the magnetic field lines that would be emanating from the sun. Almost everything we care about, Earth, Venus, Mars, uh, many of the satellites of NASA are all aggregated over on this lower right quadrant, 
but over on this side, on the uh, far side of the system here, we have the one spacecraft, the stereo spacecraft, as the red square. This blast of material from the sun, the coronal mass ejection, moved out from the sun to the stereo location in about 17 and a half hours. This is uh, absolutely as fast as the Carrington event of 1859. So we uh, believe that this, uh, this is very closely analogous to what the Carrington event was like. And uh, if the Earth had been at the location of the stereo spacecraft, which is about 1 AU, or uh, said differently, if this event had occurred just a week earlier, the Earth would have been subjected to a Carrington-type event. And uh, this is pretty sciencey here, but it really shows that stereo measurements allowed us to look at the magnetic field from the uh, in the chromal mass ejection, look at the solar wind speed, look at the density, and we can run those kind of data through our models of well, what kind of geomagnetic storm would be generated. And uh, the in this figure, the um, red one is the largest storm in this, in terms of this index called the DST index, a measure of geomagnetic storm activity. That's the largest storm that's been seen since the DST index has been generated since uh, 1957. <clears throat> the largest storm of the 20th century was about 589 in these units. The uh, July uh, 2012 storm, had it hit the Earth, would probably have produced something at least twice as large in that index and uh, at about uh, 1,200 uh, nanotesla. So it would have been by far the largest storm that we've ever seen. Um, and we missed that by maybe a week or a few days. So uh, this has led to a number of people uh, like Ying Liu and others uh, studying the event as well, getting a deeper understanding of what was going on there. And uh, they uh, concluded very similarly to us that uh, this storm would have produced uh, the largest DST by far that's ever been seen. They also made the important recognition that uh, this was really two different um, coronal mass ejections in rapid succession. So this is a very slow moving animation here, um, but uh, it gives me a little chance to talk through this more and it again labels a lot of the spacecraft so you can sort of uh, get the picture. But this active region during a relatively modest solar activity cycle <clears throat> nonetheless is uh, immensely active, powerful, popping off chronal mass ejections uh, in, uh, several times. The line moving across there shows uh, that there was one chronal mass ejection that went out and sort of cleared out the system. And then this next one that's coming along moved out much more strongly, much faster. And so this kind of one-two punch where you have uh, a disturbance and then it, uh, the second one can move out more or less unimpeded can really lead to the most intense kind of geomagnetic, geomagnetic storms. And this is what we really worry about. So what about addressing um, space weather? Um, we, uh, have, we are in a magnificent time now with the observations of the sun. Uh, we are seeing it from many different angles. We have this ability to study uh, the drivers of space weather with unprecedented uh, skill and unprecedented knowledge. We can see those. We have also in, in uh, operation now many spacecraft systems in the Earth's vicinity. We can understand these impacts on the power grid. We're recognizing from many of the operating spacecraft that these nice cartoons we often show of the Earth's magnetosphere and its magnetic environment, nice laminar flow, really are not very accurate. The system is much more turbulent and disturbed than we previously thought. These kind of currents flowing down from space can be coupled into pipelines and power grid. They can cause the kind of outages that we've seen on uh, more regional scales, like in 1989 in Quebec. These power outages uh, are severe, uh, but they can also be coupled then with the kind of loss of ground-to-ground -ground ionospheric communication high frequency that we've talked about. These can affect uh, aircraft operation. Also, the uh, transmission through the ionosphere, as we talked about, knocking out uh, communication for things like GPS and ATMs and other kinds of things that we just have come to depend on. Of course, precision agriculture, 
navigation at sea can all be um, severely impacted in the way we've talked about. And the operating spacecraft, the constellation as a whole can be affected. But individual spacecraft, either the degradation of the solar panels or knocking out of electronics, all of these are worries. Uh, and ultimately, of course, the risk to humans in space is a substantial one. So we're fortunate to have many scientific satellites now that are giving us these uh, wonderful views. But uh, another study that I uh, was privileged to um, lead, I guess I do a lot of studies for the NRC, but um, this is a, a very recent decadal survey, as it's called. This is uh, every decade or so, the disciplines of solar and space, of uh, space science and earth science are, it's demanded by Congress that these disciplines uh, do a self-evaluation of what are the most important issues, what are the uh, what are the things that should be pursued in the next decadal interval. And our report uh, released in uh, 2012 uh, covered the period 2013 to 2022. And uh, our study about solar and space physics made the point that we have magnificent scientific tools at our, uh, at our disposal now, but that we really need a much more operational kind of space weather system uh, we've built the, our present space weather capability largely on the back of these scientific satellites that are not required to operate 24-7. They are not required to be replaced once they've uh, run out of utility uh, or that they fail. And uh, the uh, recommendation, the very strong recommendation in the decadal survey that we made was that we really need to use these scientific tools, yes, but we also need to have a national or truly an international space weather observing capability so that we can keep our eye on the sun and see the consequences in the Earth's vicinity. Many of these satellites that we see here do have real-time capability and are contributing right now to our space weather readiness, but we uh, need to uh, do better. The RBSP, or what was renamed in November 2012, the Van Allen probes, are one great example of this, where uh, this, the spacecraft were built at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. I was privileged to be a principal investigator on the Van Allen probes, and uh, using the scientific data from these spacecraft, sort of the first thing right out of the box, we discovered that there are not just two Van Allen belts, but there can be a third ultra relativistic electron belt um, on occasion. So this third belt was uh, one of the early discoveries of the Van Allen probe mission. And um, recognizing that, again, the things that we thought we knew so well um, can be different, can be quite different than we expected. And um, as Don recalls, I think I cited the great American philosopher, uh, Yogi Berra, who said, you can observe a lot just by looking and this ability to look at the system with new eyes was uh, crucially important. So we um, have now the Van Allen probes uh, joining a lot of other scientific satellites and some operational satellites that are, constitute an observatory fleet that's um, circling the Earth, giving us this unprecedented information about the Earthward end of the Sun-Earth system. Combined with what I think I've shown you before is the uh, solar observing satellites, a, a magnificent set of tools. We've never had it so good, but um, as a society, we need to use all of these assets and we need to make sure that we continue to have these kinds of assets into the future in order to observe this uh, connected Sun-Earth system that I spoke about before. So um, people often ask me, what, what do we do about this threat to the um, power grid and uh, in a little uh, article in Space Weather Journal, I just reported on one um, one kind of uh, group that meets regularly now, the Electric Infrastructure Security Summit. And uh, these these points are pretty uh, evident, I suppose. But uh, one thing is that we really need to establish pretty clearly how bad can it get, and and so identifying uh, a worst case. And I believe that the case I showed you for July 2012 is a great uh, start on this. That tells us how bad it can really get. 
we need to identify as a society the critical infrastructure. We can't protect everything or all facilities, but we uh, maybe can identify the core technologies that have to be protected. Detailed modeling of the effects, go to step one here and take the worst case and then war game this through um, and look at what the influence of the severe space weather would be on our present national power grid is a crucial step. And then finally, for uh, accomplishing step two, uh, identifying ways to block the effects of geomagnetically induced currents and to protect the uh, key inf infrastructure is an obvious step that needs to be taken. And I think if these four steps were followed through assiduously, we could be a much safer society. So let me just conclude by saying that um, I believe that we have uh, before us the ability to address and probably solve the space weather puzzle uh, in many respects. Uh, we have uh, space and ground observations. We need to add more. We need better models to take this information and turn it into knowledge and wisdom. Um, and uh, with uh, this complete uh, forecasting capability and uh, an ability to provide alerts and warnings, in addition to the kind of steps to protect key infrastructure, I think that this is a soluble problem, but it's a, an expensive and uh, requires tremendous commitment from policymakers and from uh, scientists and from engineers. So to summarize, I'd say the challenges of space weather really do affect all developed and developing countries, both civilian and military systems. This work on space weather, um, specification, modeling, forecasting, I think has great societal benefits. So in many ways, uh, I would say it's basic research with a high public purpose. Uh, almost all future space exploration, of course, most modern human endeavors will require that we have a better, more capable understanding of, and transition more of our knowledge to operations. And one of the questions uh, that may be in your mind is how do we adequately deal with these threats without being uh, unduly uh, sen sensationalist? Maybe the question is how to be duly sensationalist and uh, avoid this chicken little, the sky is falling syndrome but still get policymakers to step up and recognize this as a significant threat. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions if uh, there are any. Anyone there? Sally, do you want to ask your question? I know you asked Claire, but I didn't know if you wanted to talk more about that. Uh, well, I was just wondering, does all this information help with predicting these storms so that they can be prepared? Does this information help in predicting? In predicting so that we can be prepared for whatever we, we um, you know, will encounter blackouts yes. or yes. an astronaut. Yes, I think that um, knowing what the sun is doing, being able to see what the sun is doing, and being able to follow these kinds of uh, the most uh, significant of these disturbances out allows us to predict um, a substantial amount about what's going to happen. The uh, predictions about uh, the solar energetic particles and the arrival of the coronal mass ejections has been getting much better. One of the problems that we have with the coronal mass ejection story is that we don't know from looking at the sun alone what the orientation of the magnetic field is within this cloud of material. And not knowing that can turn an event either into the extreme, like the July 2012 event that we saw, or it can be uh, pretty benign if the interplanetary field is in the wrong orientation. Effectively, if the field is pointed opposite to the Earth's field that is southward uh, directed in interplanetary space, the storm is going to be generally a very large one. If it's pointed northward, um, it's going to be more benign. And uh, that's been the missing ingredient in our forecasting ability is to really know how strong uh, the uh, magnetic field is and what its orientation is. And has the um, coronal mass ejection um, 
affected the measurement? Like its density, I know its shape, but does it like strip things away? Yes. Or? Yes. It does. It uh, it compresses and distorts the magnetosphere very substantially. It can drive the uh, normal outer boundary of the magnetosphere, which may be out around uh, 10 or 12 Earth radii. That's been driven in as close as uh, three or four Earth radii um, from the center of the Earth. Uh, so it massively compresses and distorts the system. And uh, it can uh, sort of strip away the outer layers of the protective uh, magnetic envelope around the Earth for, uh, you know, for a period of time. The Halloween storms, for example, caused a complete re- distribution of the radiation belt particles around the earth and caused uh, particles uh, that caused the radiation belts to reform in places that simply hadn't seen high energy electrons uh, for a very long time and uh, that's what caused a lot of the spacecraft operational anomalies that occurred during that storm period by the way um, these coronal mass ejections probably have played a very important role in other planetary systems. We have a new mission um, that's being run out of our lab in Colorado called MAVEN, a Mars mission. And uh, MAVEN is uh, at Mars right now uh, in orbit around Mars, when in orbit on the 21st of September. And it's going to be studying how these coronal mass ejections strip away the upper atmosphere of Mars. This probably contributed a lot to the ultimate loss of the atmosphere of Mars and the water from Mars. So uh, these uh, solar blasts really play a pretty important role in planetary uh, atmosphere development. Don, can I just say that um, it's very interesting to hear the actual detail of how uh, solar storms affect things like power grids, I guess, you know, in the solar community, we, we throw these terms around and these sort of end results around without really thinking them through. So it's, it's been really interesting to hear the detail of where the actual damage happens or what's the, the specific occurrence that causes this to be a problem. So thank you for that. That was, that was very, uh, very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think that um, we, we hear, you know, sort of broad assertions that the sun is active and uh, maybe until we think it through, we don't realize the many ways that uh, that activity can manifest itself or it can affect our, our systems. And, and uh, not every solar storm, you know, has, is the same on all the different axes, on all the different uh, things. You can have a storm that maybe is weak in terms of the solar energetic particles, but very strong in terms of the coronal mass ejection, plasma flows. Um, in other cases, you might have a very, very strong X-ray flare, but the coronal mass ejection might go off in a direction that doesn't hit the Earth. All of these things are possible, and I suppose in many ways we worry most about the perfect solar storm, probably the kind that, again, the, uh, the July 2012 event would have been had the Earth been in the wrong place, but where, where you've got the combination of a strong flare followed by very strong enhancement of solar energetic particles and then a, the blast of the chrome mass ejection getting there in such a short period of time that you would have very little time uh, as a society to really prepare for the effects either. Um, you know, going from the sun out to uh, the Earth's orbit in, uh, 17 or 18 hours means that uh, one would have less than probably half a day or something like that to even start to mobilize your defenses. I've got a question yeah. that uh, moves away from the electrical aspect uh, and goes to the major, very large pipelines that are being constructed. Yes. We have one here in Alaska, it's 800 miles long. Yep. And large enough to carry over a million barrels of oil a day. When the Keystone Pipeline is going to get built, and it will get built, it's going to be way longer and much larger. What kind of ramifications would a, say, a carrying event have on those pipelines? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, uh, as you well know, in uh, Alaska, where the geomagnetic, where the currents, the geomagnetic induced currents, are a much more regular phenomenon. 
there were uh, very substantial problems with that requiring special treatment grounding. Otherwise, uh, these large currents could quickly sort of burn a hole in the pipe and cause massive uh, damage, environmental damage and so on. Um, for the uh, more mid-latitude pipelines under, say, normal geomagnetic conditions, one might not worry so much about that. But as these much stronger storms occur, the activity tends to move down to lower latitudes, and uh, and these would become susceptible. So um, it would be a rarer but much more significant problem under the most extreme um, space weather conditions for that. And I think this has to be uh, a very significant part of the planning process for any kind of long, whether it's wires or pipes or anything that uh, that can act as a collector of uh, these geomagnetically induced currents over very vast distances. The potentials that can be generated in these uh, storms is, is really huge. I mean, it can be thousands of volts, uh, you know, tens of thousands of volts uh, of potential difference, very strong currents flowing, and uh, it doesn't take long to sort of uh, eat their way through um, the most uh, well-designed pipes. Very significant concern. Thank you. Yes. Chris said he lost his audio, okay. but he has a question. Is the ESA's solar orbiter mission still moving forward? Yes, it is. Uh, my, uh, just We had briefings on that today, as a matter of fact, the meeting I was at. And it uh, looks like it's moving toward a uh, 2017 launch. Yes. NASA has, is providing um, in, you know, some instruments for that. I, I believe it's providing the launch vehicle for that. And there's, a, there is actually some of the scientists from the Space Sciences Lab are helping with some of the instrumentation for sticks. Um, they have joined positions between SSL and uh, an institute in Switzerland, actually, and the, the, the PI for Styx is a researcher from SSL, so that's, that's uh, moving mm -hmm. forward. It's going to be based on, for those of you who know RESI from back in the day, um, it's going to be based on RESI, but like an updated, much better, higher quality version of RESI. Mm -hmm. right. And everybody just thinks the sun is a star, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. I say it's the it's the most important star uh, to our in our lives, at least. But you know, it's uh, it's been fascinating to be part of the Kepler program. Uh, we're doing the operations for Kepler at last, and um, and seeing the data coming back from other sun-like stars, and seeing the within you know that that general description about the same size, about the same age. Uh, but uh, there's tremendous variability from one sun to the next. And uh, um, we see on some of the sun-like stars activity that is uh, orders of magnitude greater than the sun's activity. And uh, flares that are, uh, you know, like, a uh, thousand or ten thousand times as powerful as the flares that we see from uh, from our sun now. So it, it again begs the question of of how how large could these solar disturbances really be, and uh, could could we how extreme can extreme events really become? And uh, I think that's the that's the challenge that many of us in the space weather business are really facing as we you know we get asked by policymakers well how bad could it be and we really don't know the answer we've only you know we've been observing the sun uh, effectively for a few decades and um, we don't really know the answer to that question and the sun's been operating for four and a half billion years and it's presumably done lots of things at that time So I have another question. You briefly said that the Kepler mission was seeing solar storms, sunspots, 
on some of the stars that it was looking at. Yes. I know we haven't had enough time to to build up our database on that yet, but are they seeing the bigger the star, the more sunspots or vice versa? Or, or are they just now noticing that they're out there? Well, of course, the um, as you say, the, the database is there. The, these active stars are really an annoyance to the Kepler program. Um, what uh, what they're trying to do is to look for the signature of uh, planets moving across, and uh, so having a quiet star so that the uh, diminution of light uh, can be uh, done effectively for the planet uh, is the sort of the, the norm. When you have a very active uh, star or so, that sort of messes up that whole program. So in a sense. The, uh, the normal Kepler folks would throw away or want, want to throw out the data from these more active stars. But there are, of course, many scientists who are really interested in studying the, uh, this, uh, this aspect of sun-like stars. And so um, that's, that has now been, uh, there are a number of Japanese uh, scientists, a number of American scientists who have been uh, really taking that database and running with it. And and that uh, looking at the most extreme of those uh, helps to put our own sun into better perspective, and uh, and so this is uh, this is the great benefit of comparative studies, whether it's comparative planetary or comparative solar uh, stellar studies, um, and uh, I think the you know the final word has yet to be written about this, but it's really uh, stimulated a lot of thought about just how active our star could become. Hi, uh, this is Paul Higgins from uh, Trinity College in Lockheed Martin, and um, I've heard a lot of talk over the last few years about um, long-term solar activity uh, affecting Earth's climate, and I was just curious if you have any update on that, or have you seen any convincing research that that's the case? Because I do know that a lot of the climate scientists want <laughs> the solar physicists to, to stay out of that, <laughs> and that they're really you know, they're yeah. diluting yeah. some of the, the yeah. climate research. Yeah, I get uh, that question a lot too, Paul. I, w I really would like to hear the answer to that. Yeah, no, it's a it's a very good question, and indeed, um, uh, the, let's say the uh, some some uh, climate scientists would rather not uh, broaden the discussion too much. Would not, like to sort of reduce reduce the noise level, and uh, and stay focused on the anthropogenic effects uh, on climate. Um, but I think that. Uh, Again, uh, folks in our lab uh, have now maintained this record for some 35 years or so of the solar variability, and the solar irradiance varies, uh, on mo you know, modestly, a few tenths of a percent over the solar cycle, and um, and that is the backdrop upon which human-induced uh, climate change effects are uh, are superimposed. So. I think it, it's bad science not to study all the things that affect the uh, the atmosphere of the Earth, and of course uh, the the record shows that prior to say 1950 or 1960, that uh, almost all the variability of uh, of the Earth's atmosphere could be accounted for by the <clears throat> variation in the solar irradiance and other uh, effects, you know, volcanoes and things like that. Uh, I think the record is that since since the mid '50s, the the signal has started to emerge very clearly that the anthropogenic effect is is the dominant one. But still, um, you know, having um, a study of the uh, of the solar forcing, and uh, more than that, even the energetic particles, the solar protons that come into the atmosphere and change the chemistry of the middle atmosphere, even the magnetospheric particles that I was talking about a little bit can all affect this. And so I think good science really dictates that all of those things need to be included in the models, even though we know or we strongly suspect that the anthropogenic forcing has been the dominant thing over the last few decades. So um, so I think, uh, I think scientists sort of harm themselves when they say, let's not think about that, let's not include this, let's not focus on this, let's, uh, let's just look at one, one uh, facet of a problem 
uh, usually that leads to problems and suspicion about the motives of scientists and so on. So I, I don't personally uh, support that uh, view. And I guess to answer your question more, uh, I think I've answered the question, but but I'd say that uh, it's pretty clear in recent times that the, the dominant effect is, uh, is more the greenhouse gases that's been dominating the uh, temperature changes in recent times. But even there, um, I was just at a meeting where this was, in fact, the, the meeting in China talked quite a bit about this. And uh, there's some real puzzles, you know, the, the temperatures have sort of plateaued and, uh, and so uh, the uh, global temperatures have sort of plateaued and uh, maybe downturn a little bit and people don't really understand these things and so these uh, immensely confident uh, statements about we've we've modeled everything we understand it all I think that's uh, that's quite an overstatement there's this is an immensely complex system driven by many different factors and uh, I don't think we've got all the answers by any means yet Thanks. I'm going to steal that answer from now on when people ask me about that. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Baker. We so appreciate oh, all your time. And, you. and this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm, I am really sorry that more people weren't here to, to hear. I'm glad the recording will be available for them to watch because they, they will be it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. So thank you so much for, for buzzing in from where you are in the world to do this for us. Uh, and, uh, and there is interest in, in um, seeing more of your slides, if, if, uh, although we also have them here too, so perhaps we can talk about that um, at a later date. So. Okay, well, it's my pleasure, and thank you all for, for um, listening uh, patiently and, uh, and for the good questions. and. Um, I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions that might occur to you. So just drop me a, an email line or something. And uh, uh, Dawn, thank you very much for arranging this. It's uh, quite a pleasure for me. Oh, thank you. This was this was really enjoyable. I thank you so much for um, for spending time with us today. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, good luck with all the good stuff you guys are doing. We uh, we also have a um, a Wigio page. It's a uh, it's like an online. Um, communication tool and mm -hmm. we'd be happy to set you up with that if you would like to um, if you'd like to be a part of our of our group and see the discussions about uh, the Sun and about um, about different topics that Great. you may be interested in as well okay so uh, I hope we'll be in touch about that okay sure thank you so much okay thanks have a safe trip back thanks talk to you later bye 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 Yeah, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. And I, I know that others don't know this, that this is a, well, Dawn said at the beginning of the presentation that this was uh, a talk that she'd heard given and she um, brought it to our attention. And, and uh, golly, Dawn, you were so right. This was so great. Um, it's such wonderful, needful information about uh, Vic. I had not even thought about the pipelines and the fact that they're all, you just don't think about this stuff, right? You don't think about it in the same way that we, we think about other things um, and holy cow, it's, um, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of scared for you now, Vic. <laughs> I'm kind of scared now. <laughs> you too, Lynn, a little scared for you. <laughs> the reason they brought it up is a few years back, they were having some serious, serious problems with the pipeline degrading. It was uh, literally corroding faster than they predicted and that's what they, almost came up with the conclusion. It was, there was just too much electricity running and it produced by the magnetic fields. And our pipeline is going to make, or it, our pipeline is gonna be little compared to the Keystone when it's done. And if you think it's not gonna happen, they're already stacking pipe. I was by it last week, huge fields of pipe getting ready to drive oil to the south. Just waiting for the green light, I'm sure. Just waiting yeah, for the green it's, light. It's going to happen if they just do it right. Well, yeah, and you just, you know, how much we are so dependent on um, radio technology, you know, how much, and just even in that, you know, electricity, I think about all how we just even mess with um, 
you know, how that just affects different things with all the amount of electricity and EMFs that we are generating with all of our technological pieces that we just, because we don't see it, right? We take it for granted. So um, Don, thank you. That was, it was just absolutely fascinating. I am, we are over time. I'm sure that many people have other things they want to do. It's been fun to watch Berkeley's sun uh, light change as you guys, <laughs> I mean, watching the sun come across your, your face. Like, There's no sun here. It's all dark. But um, so, you know, I, I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for your questions. We will uh, be working with Dr. Baker to get his slides. Um, he's being very generous in making them available to you. And, uh, and we will definitely see if we can get him hooked up to our um, community so that you can ask questions. And uh, Ricky, you'll let us know when you get the YouTube video posted for us. Awesome. Um, and then, uh, as it says on our agenda, that we uh, have decided to...